Hello and welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's session is going to be another open session, uh, but we, uh, as always, before that, we're going to jump into our image of the week, which I'm going to share with you right here. Let's see here. Uh, this week's image of the week go is uh, Barnard 150 by Jeff Weiss. I pointed this out last week because I just kind of liked the uh, the way the dark dark dust kind of that inky blackness stands up off the non-black sky uh it takes a lot of imaging time and really dark skies to pull this stuff out but uh when you do and when you do a great job uh really has a dramatic effect uh congrats jeff and as always guys submit your images right there image of the week submission click it and it'll bring you in ask you for a few details and to upload your image and then you're in in the meantime you can check out some of the other images uh okay that is that. Um, moving on to today's uh, open session. First things first. Uh, last week we were talking about, or someone, uh, well, we were talking about observatories. Uh, there were a few different main types that I brought up to specifically roll off roofs and dome style observatories. And then someone uh, midway through brought up uh, what's actually uh, what I'd call a third type or a variant on what we're using. Let's see, uh, how can I share it? Because uh, somebody shared in chat uh, their observatory. Uh, basically, it is uh, what we call the Rubbermaid Observatory. Um, uh, it's obser an observatory that is modified from basically one of those Rubbermaid sheds you would get at Lowe's or Home Depot or any hardware store that sells this type of stuff. It's usually uh, uh, packed flat, so you can even buy it online and have it shipped, or if you are uh, lugging it out to some remote place, um, you can probably put it in your truck or whatnot and, and get it out there relatively easy. Uh, it does not involve uh, bringing out a whole bunch of tools, pouring concrete, uh, basically all those very intimidating things about building an observatory or even hiring a contractor. You, you can do this yourself. Um, and that's uh, one of the benefits of, of uh, what I'll call the Rubbermaid Observatory. And they're offering these sheds in all sorts of different sizes. So there would be uh, you might find that there's a particular configuration that really suits your needs well. Uh, some of us imagers want a, a very, very small shed. Don't really need much room to walk around in there, only enough to change the gear and get out. Uh, so, uh, or even for that matter, a very tall shed. Um, so you can build a smaller pier and basically um, have it going uh, quickly. Um, some people, so they don't even have to build the pier, will cut three holes in the bottom and uh, put a tripod in there. Uh, like I said, if, if all that extra work is going to be intimidating for you and you can find a way to build yourself a, a permanent pier holder or a permanent telescope holder, then uh, this could be a great option. Uh, I do believe that I have another image here that I'll try and show you just so you can get the full idea. This is more of a, an overhead view. Um, so I believe that when you get these, uh, I, I don't know about this particular shed, but when you get some of these, um, straight from Lowe's or Home Depot, uh, it has a bar that goes directly across the top from basically the, uh, the pier of the top there to the pier over here. And, uh, to modify these, that's kind of what you have to address. So you might have to make it more rigid, um, but uh, what, uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna peek up here and see what um, <clears throat> Chris, who uh, had shared this shed with us, uh, what he's saying about it. Seven by seven shed. Um, a few people are asking him some questions on it. Uh, there was a Yahoo group uh, I believe called Rubbermaid Observatories or something of the sort that uh, had had basically the most info. When I was looking into building my observatory and I was considering a project like this, that's where I was looking. Um, but uh, I, I don't know if that Yahoo group still exists or if the data is still there, so you'd at least be able to get some ideas or plans. Uh, Chris is saying he thinks it was $700 three years ago. 
um, they they seem to be around that um, at the at the garden centers. Uh, in some cases, even less. Um, I want. I know they offer like. Uh, there's one that I want to say is like two hundred and fifty dollars that I think people have actually used to build observatories out of it. Uh, it's vertical. Um, vertical sheets that are maybe a foot and a half wide so it packs really really small uh but when i saw it set up at home depot it was really flimsy uh not the type of thing you want to put um a whole lot of expensive gear inside um so keep that in mind when you're looking at them uh, best in my opinion to go with something that's more of a name brand a rubbermaid or something um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, being pointed out, um, the top and clamshell observatories. I don't know if that's a particular website, but okay. Yeah. So it looks like he used two by fours to reinforce it. I'm sure there was some sort of internal roof structuring that he had to, uh, pull out of there and modify. Uh, I even see some bolts going through there. So there's some slight modifications that you have to make, but it's nothing like building your own observatory from scratch. Um, Definitely a good uh, a good option for you if you just want to get something set up so you don't have to set up and polar align every single night. That's basically what it is: is avoiding the polar alignment. Um, put he put a frame inside of it. Uh, he did pour a slab, and then I can see that he had a permanent pier. Um, He tied the frame to the slab and the pier is isolated from the slab, right? Um, so very, uh, very nice observatory. Looks like it gets the job done well. Um, okay, taking my camera back. It is an open session tonight and I was begging the guys in the room to uh, bring up uh, a topic. So uh, the first topic that came to mind is, hey, anybody know how to get a good picture of a comet? Um, so uh, we all started chatting in the room and then we immediately put a stop to it because basically we should do that chatting in this external room. Uh, so I think uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show off my image of my comet or actually my animation of my comet uh oh you can't see that can you you cannot see that okay let's see how i fix this let's see how i fix this sorry for the infinite window Oh, I'm sorry. Now I lost. Now I lost the comment picture. Um, I know. I don't know if you guys have this your picture available. It's going to take me a few seconds to get to this. No, it isn't. There it is. <laughs> Million windows. There we go. Uh, so this is a comment picture that I took. Uh, Comet Hartley, um, I'm, I can check the details on it for you in a second, but basically uh, what I did was I had a wide field image uh, with Comet Hartley uh, right there, and this is the Pac-Man Nebula, uh, what is that, NGC 281 maybe, something like that. Um, but uh, basically once you acquire the data, RGB data, um, you can process it a number of different ways to give you a lot of different stuff. So basically I could have the comet streak through the image or I could have the stars streak and the comet um, basically show up as if it's um, uh, still, so to speak. So you would see a bit more of the tail, um, but you could take the same data and animate it, which uh, here we go. You can see as I animate it, the comet's slowly moving through the frame. 
Um, this was processed in Deep Sky Stacker. Uh, I did this. Uh, must have been seven or eight years ago. Um, I wasn't so good at what I was doing. Uh, I wasn't as good at what I'm doing now. Uh, but uh, I think I managed to get a pretty good image. Uh, so people in the room, uh, I know I've seen some better I, images I, than that one. I, I have a question for you right before we go. Go ahead. Um, what, um, if you're using RGB, you're going to get a red comet in place XYZ, and then a blue one and a green one, and then because the, the comet keeps moving. How do you get the com color on the comet? Uh, so actually, I did um, uh, that was one shot color. Uh, okay. I believe you. I believe you can do RGB. Uh, you're just kind of uh, you. You can't. Well, first of all, it's going to depend on the focal length because how much is the comet moving through the image relative to the stars. Uh, but if you're taking one minute subs, um, when you align your stars. Uh, the stars are going to align on each other, and the comet's going to be smudged through the frame a little bit over the period of three minutes. Uh, but it may, but the comet's kind of smudged to begin with. It may not be that devastating. Uh, it is better to use a one-shot color, uh, but if you don't have a one-shot color, if you only have a CCD with RGB filters, it's worth a shot, and you'll probably get pretty good results. So I saw an image recently or from a, a guy on Astrobin I follow, Niels Christensen, and um, you know, I'll, I'll put the picture up. Uh, he, he did LRGB, just like LRGB, 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 back to back to back. Um, so here is, here is that image here, and that came out pretty nice. Let me see if it is, let me say down here how exactly he stacked it. Yeah, he does. Um, and uh, I, I put a link, I'll, I'll put the link in the... Uh, Astro Imaging Site text box. Um, oh, I have to log in. Hang on. <laughs> okay. uh, but yeah, so that, that came out pretty. Now, so it is possible. And he's using a uh, F6.2 16 inch LX200. Yep. Yeah, and if you're actually shooting uh, LRGB, then you can use basically L frames just for the luminance. Uh, let that be your sharp detail frame. And the RGB frames, just like RGB for deep sky stuff, uh, I believe um, having perfect uh, smudge proof, so to speak, data, I don't, I, I'm not sure that's terribly important. Um, there, there's going to be a point where you're going to see some of that smudging, but uh, he's using a 16 inch, so uh, I did not see length of exposures. Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. There you go. So looks like he kept the exposures a bit shorter. Uh, in this particular image, um, there's no other object besides the comet. Uh, what might be a little bit more difficult is if you're trying to pull out a deep sky object. Um, I was just gonna. I, I was just gonna say, in, in that case, you would do two separate images. You would image the location without the comet a week later or a week before, and then you could actually, and this on the second time. You could actually guide on the comet and just then combine the two images. That, that would be one way. That's an interesting idea. Yeah, I was going to say, and if you're willing to cheat, you can do it. No, but uh, the, the point being um, the object is always up there and the object basically isn't changing. And you need more time on that object uh, than is available with a comet passing in front of it, right? So if you're limiting yourself by just that time that the comet's in front of it, you're not going to get enough time on the object to really pull it out. So uh, you can shoot the object, shoot the comet, and then combine them in software. And um, even us... Uh, That's not cheating. 
Uh, no, I know. I, 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 <laughs> it's not cheating. Even us, hey. even us uh, strict astronomers say it's not cheating. So, Hey, Tolga, tell us about uh, tracking with the Paramount. Oh, okay, so um, I, I don't want to make this a commercial, but in, in some mounts, I, let me just say in some mounts, uh, you can track. You can set the tracking rate of the mount to the object. In in uh, some mounts, you could do like you can set the tracking rate of the sun, right? You can set the tracking of the moon. But on some more advanced mounts, you can set the tracking rate of the mount to a satellite or versus or to a comet. Or as long as the TLE file of that system is in the mount's software, you can set it to anything in there. So. Um, Yes, so that's the answer. And and then you'd get a picture of the comet going through a blurred star field. Correct, because the mount will be tracking at the comet rate, not on the side rail rate. Mm -hmm. But then well, again, th this, this would apply to that <laughs> trick or the cheat uh, I mentioned. What you would do is you would image the star field a week before or a week after or the next day uh, what it could, mm. what the same exact location then then afterwards you would combine the two data to get pieces together of course well, couldn't you just couldn't you just re-register the same frames and have them um, uh, register on the stars and then hope that your um, software drops out the, the comet going through I don't think I can well, you say that again Oh yeah, like, like we were talking about, like rejection. rejection. Use the, if yeah. you use like a yeah, rejection, uh, that'd be asking rejection to do a lot. Because yeah, I mean, like like Deep Sky Stacker has a routine where you can do, you can have the star streak, the comet streak, or have both be steady, and that's a pretty handy tool. And you you, you have to tell it where the comet is, but it can it can do it. Um, the only problem I see with potentially like doing the thing where you have the where you take the background previously is if your comet in the streaked image where you're tracking the comet has a tail, then you'd have to edit out any stars that are streaked in that tail before you combine the two images together. Correct. Uh, which could be difficult. Yeah, yeah, it can be. But if you have like an uh, interesting object in the background, that's the only way to do it very nicely where you would have like a let's say let's say the lagoon nebula or something like something a comet going through uh like just uh, like adam said there's no way to do justice to the nebula in the background and do justice to the comet you know you, you're gonna have to compromise yeah i mean depends if the comet is particularly slow moving though like when i did a 41p last year my single frames, the comet moves a tiny bit in my three minute long subframes, but with a camera like a, like a ZWO 1600 uh, Pro, um, again, not to advertise, but that's what I'm using. The, the color, if you use the color version, for instance, it's, it's uh, the monochrome version is quite sensitive. I think the color version is also fairly sensitive and you could do a lot of objects with that or a similar camera that's fairly sensitive. Adam, you want yeah. to do? Please, Eric. I'm going to share my screen. This is how you do it using absolutely brute force and no Comet software whatsoever, just normal processing software. That's going to count down. And that was Lovejoy, uh, 2015. And so we did it two different ways. So basically, here is it where you've registered on the Comet. That is after the fact, after you've collected all your frames, not before. And I I'll play this one more time. And then I did another one where I registered on the stars and let the comet move through the field. Again, done in Photoshop. And here, let's look at the other one. And I just put some timestamps. I put a little counter on there so people wouldn't get impatient and click off before the, the GIF actually loaded. And, and this was done, again, brute force. I took 77 frames, 30 seconds each, RGB, RGB, for a period of three hours at uh, bin two. So with bin two, when you processed it, you could get the, the green comet. You couldn't get much star color, but then 
I didn't really care about star color. So basically I had 77 processed frames with flats and biases and everything else. And then I put them all into Photoshop. And in one case, then I moved it and made them stacks. And in one case, I just physically aligned all the stars and let the comet play through and cropped the image so that the period that the comet moved gave me a black space with no comet. I just cropped that particular stack to include all the frames that had actual stars in it with no black in it. And then exported it as a Photoshop animated GIF, which was a relatively small file. That is really cool. And then in the in the other one, then I did the same thing with another identical stack, except in this case, I went through frame by frame by frame, 77 process frames, and just put the comment right there, aligned it, and then the stars moved through. And again, cropped it so that the area where there were no stars was not in the frame. And that was a crop. And then exported that as an animated GIF. For some reason, this one of them came out with a better tail than the other. I'm not, not sure why. And this was done, my gosh, three and a half years ago when all of our processing skills were vastly diminished from today. So today, I'm sure there's a lot more animation than I could done here. And these are posted on Astrobin, and it shows. And I guess the other thing, which is obvious, is you know, I read online that there was a comet. I just got its coordinates. I put it into the mount. I went there, and then there was this faint little bit of nothing. And I watched it for about an hour, and it moved. And I said, well, that must be it, because it doesn't really jump out at you. You know, it's not this bright, not as bright as a star, although it seems bright here because there's a little processing involved. Um, can you can you, can you see can my you screen? screen? I'm shocked. Sure. Are we done? Uh -oh. yep. uh, Alex, I do see your screen. I hear an echo though. Talk again. Tell testing one, two, three. Am I echoing still? No. You're good. You're good. Okay, um, I, there's a, uh, is anybody over in PhD? There's a comet tracking. Can you see that? I've got the PhD manual up right here. And apparently um, what you do is you click on the, um, you, you call up comet tracking someplace in PhD. I've never tried it, so I don't know. Um, and you tell it, okay, enable it. And uh, you start, uh, clicking on the comet over and over and over again, and eventually it learns what it has to do to correct for the comet. And from once it learns how to do it, it just keeps on going. Does that assume that your guide camera, because uh, like my guide camera, I, my guide scope and my telescope are not quite co bore sided, so when something is in the center of my 11 inch it's never in my guide scope <laughs> well yeah <laughs> but, um, guide scope. <laughs> yeah you'd have to be able to see the comet i would guess i don't really know is anybody you know this all started before we started the show tonight um, i just think does anybody know how to do this and i'm hoping that maybe somebody else out there knows how to do this but like with off-axis guiding it's never going to be in the same field of view so i think you'd have to have a pretty well you know okay. with a guide scope and it'd have to be cobor sided right adam <clears throat> can i share a screen with you sure and i'm reading that phd thing and i think you actually train it to follow the comet yeah. then switch to a guide star and it continues the uh the offset position you give it well oh. so you could like move the you could just put the client in the guide scope's field of view and then slew the scope back and it will keep following that track well it says first Maybe? center the comet in your imaging camera okay i but just I think it'd be fun to try yeah i'm gonna have to read more into that because that seems interesting burton go ahead the, the screen is yours uh, let me see if i can bring it up here can you see that screen? Well, we're not seeing it yet. You have to hover over uh, 
on the left side of the screen, there's a green monitor with a white arrow in it. Yeah, I did. Click that, and then full screen share is probably your best bet. Okay. Sorry. Uh, your entire screen, and then click share. Burton, you only have one screen working. Um, yeah, I don't get I don't get the share screen when I go full screen. Do you see anything there now? No, it's still okay. not here. How about now? No, not yet. Yeah, you, it'll bring up a window that says share your screen, gives you an option of your entire screen or a specific application window. Uh, you would basically just click share from then. Yeah. No, well, you go on, I'll spool with this a right. bit. Yeah, so George posted um, a picture of the comet tracking window uh, and just the instructions on the bottom of that. Center the comet in the imaging camera, select a guide star and start guiding, then click start to begin training. So I believe you are training the rate of the comet or you're basically giving it um, either an XY or an RA deck offset tracking rate. Um, and it's probably gonna, when it's done with that routine, go back to just tracking on a star but it will continue giving you that offset track in the comic, I would guess. Don't know what happens when the star then goes out of the field. Maybe it picks a new star. Um, very interesting, though. Very cool sounding feature. Yeah, be, before we get too far away from this, let's remind everybody what's happening. Uh, what's, it, what's the name of the comet that's up right now? Jaren Combe Sensor or something? 21P. Okay, 21P. And, By um, uh, Giacobini I, Okay, I, I was looking at it um, visually a couple of weeks ago, and it promises to be um, um, uh, visual, you know, naked eye visual, maybe in September or so. I don't, I don't know if that's going to be true, because it certainly didn't look like much when I was watching it the first time all back. So at any rate, um, that might be good for everybody to make an effort to go out there and get a picture of a comet. So there. Just yeah. waiting on the new moon. <laughs> uh, Linda saying, does National Physics have a program that does comet satellite tracking uh, that comes with SPCC? You know, I'm not quite sure about that. Um, Horizons, that's sounding familiar. Uh, I had done custom TLE tracking with sat, a SAT tracker program. Um, APCC, uh, yeah, APCC. Um, I don't know if they built it into their new, um, into APCC, uh, but I am remembering something about custom tracking. So if you're doing some sort of custom tracking rate, then it probably is. And it probably would require APCC to uh, program it in. Yep. Okay. Um, anyone else have any cool images of comments they want to share? Any other topics they'd like to discuss? Um, someone's asking about remote, uh, uh, remote software, remote desktop software uh, besides um, TeamViewer. The other I've used is Type BNC. Tolga had mentioned that uh, he had used Chrome Remote Desktop. Um, there's another one that was mentioned, I don't know if it was last week or uh, the week before. Uh, is it no IP? Basically, from what I remember, it was a web based uh, remote viewer, remote desktop viewer. Um, it's not no IP. I know no IP is a uh, uh, 
VPN service. So I don't think it's that itself, unless it's kind of a side service that they offer. Um, no IP is standing out in my mind. I don't think it's no ID though. I forget. I forget what it was called. Um, so I'll give you a tip about the uh, Team Viewer. Uh, well, I'll give you a tip of how Team Viewer sets you for commercial use suspected thing, and I'll give you a, a resolution around it. Uh, Team Viewer, if you log into, if somebody has a commercial account and you log into their computer, you get tagged as a commercial. If you log into a school, if you log into a school, if their IP address is a commercial IP address, uh, you get ta tagged in as a commercial. But if you go into TeamViewer, uh, if you d do that by mistake and you mistakenly get tagged as a commercial user, you can go onto their website and they have a uh, dispute form. Uh, it's called commercial dispute. So, uh, just do team viewer commercial dispute search on the internet. It will come up. The, the results will come up. You just fill out a form. Uh, it, it will take them a week or two to respond and they'll respond to you and say, uh, you know, I, we believe your story and, uh, you know, we set back, you set your account back into personal use. Someone posted a link for No Machine, which looks like another uh, option for remote desktop, although it seems like it has a bit more um, functionality. Um, gives you kind of an online server. It's interesting. Uh, allow collaboration. Well, I guess uh, uh, type VNC and... Uh, um, Remote, uh, uh, remote desktop uh, uh, team viewer uh, also offer that functionality as well, uh, kind of collaboration type things. I have discovered that you have to be careful with team viewer because it's uh, you can give someone complete control over your computer and they can really mess it up. The problem I had with team viewer was that. Um, when I signed off, it would often leave me a message saying, thanks for using TeamViewer. And then I couldn't sign back onto that computer anymore until I went back into the observatory and cleared that message. And then I could sign on again. I don't know if it still does that, uh, but I gave up on TeamViewer for doing that a long time ago and just go with tight VNC, which is cheap and free. And uh, somebody says it takes up a lot less resources. I don't know what that means because I never noticed it taking up resources or not. But I don't have any problem with it, so I'm happy. Yeah, it's just a very bare bones piece of software. Uh, it doesn't have a ton of features, but it also uh, doesn't tie up um, your what is probably just a basic laptop that you don't want a great one for because uh, it's out in the dew and cold and whatever conditions your telescope are out in. Um, yeah, someone filled out that dispute, but uh, no response yet. Yeah, it takes a while. Because obviously, it's, you know, they're not being paid for this. They're often, this is a uh, free service. You know, you're, you shouldn't expect them to, you know. <laughs> um, but I, I tell you what, lately I've been using Google Chrome uh, Desktop. Uh, no, Chrome Remote Desktop. It has this... Uh, little quirks that it doesn't do this, it doesn't do that. But if you're only using it to access your own computer, it works fine. Uh, Jay saying splash top, which I've actually used as well. That works well. There are a bunch of options, and you know the way uh, the way this stuff works. Uh, you might download an option and uh, start using it, and realize it will not do something you need. Uh, or you will want to do something and uh, you'll realize that if you switch to this other particular program, then all of a sudden you can do it. Um, so it's always something to keep in mind. Uh, like, for example, some of the programs have auto file transfers. 
uh, uh, team viewer I know um, is basically a way to transfer files right over it. One thing I discovered was um, when I was using team viewer and uh, Google Drive, uh, they didn't like each other. And uh, the Google Drive, whenever it was running, it would bog down my team viewer and I wouldn't be able to get a really fast uh, kind of response to access to my setup. Um, it was like click, wait a few seconds, do the click, no, click again, open your clicks. Uh, turn off Google Drive and then all of a sudden it works. Even when it didn't seem like there were a lot of files uh, being transferred between a lot, each of them. It just seemed like there was some sort of conflict. So conflicts can happen, anything can happen. Try out a few different pieces of software and you're probably gonna find one you like, one that makes sense. Oh, come on, We've uh, that's only three topics, right? No, there's another one sitting there. Do you see the one from uh, Ad Astra? Um, that asks if you get uh, okay. uh, mosaics. The mosaic, yeah. Uh, so the question is, do mosaics give better detail than singles from a wide field of view setup? Uh, in most cases, uh, in almost all cases, yes. Uh, in fact, that would be the reason primarily for a mosaic. Um, let me, let me uh, try and give you the example this way. Um, I want a giant uh, Andromeda galaxy image over my sofa. And I want it to be six feet wide. Uh, so it's gonna be a, a 72 inch wide. Uh, let's say I'm gonna print it on metal. 72 inches wide. Um, I don't know specifically how, uh, uh, how high it's gonna be, roughly 48 I think it would be. Um, and uh, I want to print it on metal. So if I take that image with my wide field telescope and I frame it perfectly, um, when I enlarge it, uh, I'm actually enlarging it to a resolution that is not good enough for the size I want to make it. Um, I need a higher resolution version of Andromeda. And yes, I can upscale it. So I could use software to make it say, well, this is this color. So let's just make that color into four, um, four pixels. So all of a sudden we're making it four times the size. Uh, and then we'll use a little bit of smart math and try and refine it a bit. Uh, but it's not the same thing as taking lots and lots of close-ups of individual parts of the galaxy uh, and then assembling them in mosaic. So yes, uh, you will get a lot better detail out of mosaics than you will out of wide field of views. Uh, well, what's, why not just mosaic everything? Well, a two panel mosaic is relatively easy. A four panel mosaic gets slightly more difficult. Uh, when you start to get to six and eight and 12 panel mosaics, uh, not only- Shoot me. Yeah, not only is the assembling of the, the frames just time consuming and really difficult, to get them all seamless, uh, you, you really, you're just struggling. And you've got a 30 gigabyte image. You've got all, the, you've got all this data that you, you're constantly stacking on top. It just really becomes um, hard to manage. So I think the most I've gotten to was about 12, uh, 12 of one color channel. I think it was H alpha, 12 frames of one, mosaic frames of one color channel. And as I was assembling them, um, I just kind of basically lost my mind trying to do it. Uh, but yes, if you can do it, uh, you're gonna get better detail. Um, what's the, the negative? Well, uh, first you're gonna have to put a lot more time into each subframe. Uh, then you're also going to have to spend hours and hours and hours processing and assembling that mosaic. Um, the pixel does have little processor. I'm getting, I'm getting, I don't know if anyone else is hearing it. There we go. Uh, it has a nice little process for assembling a mosaic. And as you said, as you multiply the number of frames like four to two, the time goes up exponentially. 
But in the end, you can get a very high resolution uh, image, which you'll print out in eight and a half by 11 and probably won't see the difference. So it's only good if you're really printing a, a very large image to take on the display. You have to ask yourself the question, how many pixels do you need to make the picture? And I don't think that the average computer monitor can support as many pixels as the average camera sensor has on it. So your average camera sensor is already going to have more detail than your monitor on your computer is. However, if you're gonna put it someplace besides the monitor on your computer, that's a different story. Well, I guess you have to ask yourself, you know, do you feel lucky? Well, do you? Yeah, and I guess that's the, that's the reason I, the example I jumped right to is the picture that's behind your sofa, a large picture. Um, who was it? Uh, yeah, uh, but the other thing to remember uh, also, Adam, is that you're looking at your picture behind your sofa from in front of the coffee table. So you're going to be four or five feet away from it, and you're looking at the picture on your computer screen from 24 inches away, 20 inches away. Mm -hmm. So it may be a push. You know, it's a it's an art form, and I guess uh, it, it depends on how you want people to look at your image. Uh, I could see something like the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, you uh, uh, you're looking at it the six foot wide over your sofa, Andromeda Galaxy. You step back, you look at the galaxy from a distance. Um, but then uh, you have uh, uh, a a six foot wide. Uh, Cygnus, a uh, wide field Cygnus uh, constellation. Um, that you're going to look at from a distance, but then you're going to walk up closer and you're going to want to peek in and see each of the individual nebula. Um, so I, I think that would be the benefit of, of mosaicing. Uh, if, if you're like me and you shoot these wide field images and then you're like zooming and zooming and zooming and saying, I, I really like that structure in there. Uh, that might be the reason to lean more towards those high resolution things. Um, Met Met Metzavaino, uh is that his name? Uh, he was printing massive um, mosaics. Uh, I, I, he did a few installations, and just off the top of my head, they must have been 20 feet wide or more. Um, just really cool stuff that he was doing. And and Adam, I just wanted to say that we do the same thing visually when we take take a look at the Milky Way, for instance, spreading out, spreading out across the sky. And we don't get very good resolution, but then we put our 10 by 50s on it and take a look with our binoculars. And that's what you're doing with, um, with your computer screen. You may have an image that has 30 million pixels, far more than, than can fill your screen. But you go ahead and, and show it at real life size, and you can look at each of those little nebula, each of the little star clusters, or you can reduce it down to, to one tenth of its size and, and scan away, just like you do with binoculars versus different size eyepieces and stuff like that. So, yes, you get more detail. Whether you're ever going to use that detail or not depends completely on how you're viewing it. Yep. Right, correct. The, I mean, the only way it's worth to do it is if you're planning on printing it large, like Adam said. Or, I, or if you want to be able to expand it on your computer and look at it, and then, and then move someplace else, expand that, and look at it. You right. Know, Adam, when I, when I read about the PixInsight process, I decided to dive into the deep end and do a 24-panel mosaic. But I didn't do it by taking 24 images. I just downloaded the, uh, the PSS2 red data and then offset it by a certain amount with a little bit of overlap. Then I had 24 images, which gave me my, my, lumines or, yeah, my luminescence and then took a heart and soul nebula as my color frame. And it took two days to put this all together. And two days of your work or computer work? Well, the computer does not work by itself. <laughs> well, no, but I mean, it was like, you tell it to do something and go away for an hour, or? No, it, no, I wish. So, so the, luminance, the luminance came from the POSS? 
Yes, P-O-S-S, and the color came, which, you know, it's just, it's tone mapping. Yeah. So basically, you can get extraordinary detail here from the P-O-S-S data, but I would never do this again. How was the quality of the POSS data in general? Well, it was excellent for this yeah. purpose. Again, I took the red because with the red, you know, you're going to get most of the emissions on that nebula. So that, I mean, that's what you use as your luminosity layer anyway, is the narrow band red. So I thought red would be the, you know, what to use for the luminosity. And uh, one day I'll have a big room and I'll print this out, never. Put it up on the wall. But I, I would never do it again. I literally, I just had to give up after hours of doing it. And the difficult part was, okay, you start with one, then you go one plus two, one plus two, then you have that as a separate image, then three, then, and after a while, you give up. I mean, you just give up. And, and you have to. I, I mean, somebody, somebody tells me, told me that uh, what is that astrophotography tool? Is, is that a processing software? Am I saying it correctly? Uh, APP or APT? Yes, Tolka, there is such a thing. Yeah. Okay, so somebody told me, Sarah, Sarah Wager, I don't know if you guys know, mm -hmm. but she told me that it's much simpler to do mosaics in that software. I don't know anything about software. I did it in PixInsight. I did an eight-panel mosaic of the Andromeda Galaxy. And at the time I was doing it, I, would, I was saying to myself, I will never do this again. Like, I couldn't stop because I spent so much time on pro collecting the data. So I couldn't stop because I already, you know, invested so much time into it. You just can't give up on it. Uh, but I remember saying to myself, like, I'll never do this again. It, it was just... It just took me hours and hours and days and days to put this image together. It was just. Tolga, you're absolutely right. It just, it takes an extraordinary amount of time and concentration. It's not just time because you lose track of, okay, is this, is this my first eight or nine? I forgot which one was it. And if you ever lose track, then you're kind of screwed. Uh, but what the interesting part of the process is, you start off with this combined image that you see and that becomes your template that you register all the PSS images on. So you don't need to, you don't need to integrate one plus two blindly. And if you do it any other way, you'll never get the integration between the frames to be perfect. PixInsight, for whatever reason, has this down and there's been some improvements in it. So if you are in the mine and you want something big, this is the tool. People are saying it's it's most likely APP, Astro Pixel Processor. Okay, that, that's the one I was trying to think of. I'm sorry for if I messed it up. And uh, POSS Palomar uh, Observatory Sky Survey. Um, there, uh, you know, there's a lot of professional observatory data out there. The reason I asked them how the quality of it was is uh, David um, Alt had done a show previously about using Hubble data or any sort of public available data. And I always, I don't know, found the Hubble data hard to work with. Um, so, uh, and, and I've heard the Palomar stuff was a little bit better, uh, at least more familiar looking, whereas the Hubble would be really hard to use with um, your either color or luminance data and, and switch between them, or at least as, as as I process, it would be kind of difficult to use. POSS2 was actually pretty easy to, to work with. Mm -hmm. You just put in your coordinates and click download, mm -hmm. make give it a one, uh, I think you have one degree limit. Right. And but I think maybe the fact that it's terrestrial, uh, or, or I shouldn't say that, but um, uh, it's uh, a ground-based observatory as opposed to the Hubble. I don't know what it was about the Hubble, but uh, <laughs> if uh, it, it's kind of funny because if uh, I launched a, a billion dollar satellite into space and those were the results I was getting, I might be a little bit disappointed. Uh, but somehow uh, they're putting together some awesome images, um, which just makes me that, that much more excited about uh, what the James Webb and uh, what, what we can do with today's technology. One more thing about this 
this 24 panel image. I think I had to down sample it at least 50% or 25% to even get it any size to upload into Astro Bin. Mm -hmm. I saw 6,000 pixels on Astro Bin. Yeah, that's so nothing. I, I assumed it was a lot bigger than that. Oh, it was, it was yeah, 6,000, yeah, it was a lot bigger than that. I well, that, that, gets, that gets back to the question of uh, after you've done all that work, you've got to downsize it to show it anywhere. So you've lost that detail that you worked so hard to get. That's the reason why I said I think the idea has to be to print it really large, like four foot and larger. That's the only time you're really going to appreciate what you've done. Because if you print it or display it, any, anything below four feet, you're not going to see the difference. Well, I, and and not to belabor the point, but remember, was it Axel Mellinger that, that did the whole Milky Way at one point uh, with a bunch of cameras and something like that? And basically, you could you could go, you could go to any part of it and get really good detail as you scroll through on your computer. But you're right. If you're gonna if you're gonna look at the whole thing all at once, um, you're going to have to. Um, a, you got it's got to be printed big like that yeah but you, miss, you miss one of the points of doing it and that's doing it you you've actually done it there's there's i don't want to say not pride but there's some accomplishment you know wh mm -hmm. why do you climb a mountain i mean it's not because because yeah. it's there so i just in this case i just wanted to see whether you could do it this way and it i'm, I'm never going to print it out Obviously, you check that box off. Yeah, it's like if I I wasn't thinking of you know a display at Fermi Lab. You're like Molly. You've stood at the top of Glacier Point and had the picture behind you, right? Yep, right. Okay. <laughs> you were there. You got the picture and you got the T-shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, we should uh, we should uh, El Miko's got a deserves a shout out on this. Uh, he he posted his comment picture. Did you see that in the chat area? I'm missing. Hold on one second. There we go. El Mico. Let me share that. Um, where are we? There we go. Uh, don't have the details in front of me right now. Um, Obviously, it looks to me like he uh, he just guided on the stars as you know, just like a regular deep space picture, and let the comet move across for however long it took him to do that. Maybe he can type in some details down below further. But uh, congratulations, I think it's a nice looking picture. Uh, can we use filters like HA or oxygen and others with a color astro camera? Um, it's been done. Yes, yeah, so uh, let me tell you what I've done, uh, my experience. I had a DSLR, so not quite a dedicated cooled uh, astro camera, but a DSLR, so it does have the Bayer array. It has RGB uh, micro uh, micro lenses uh, in front of every single pixel. So when I put an eight alpha filter in front of that, uh, I am only using one quarter of each pixel, one quarter of the pixels on the camera, only the red. Uh, so I am reflecting away. Uh, a lot of the very, very valuable photons that I really need to hit the sensor. They're just not hitting the sensor. So I have a camera that is about a quarter as sensitive as it would be if it wasn't an OSC. And a quarter is pretty, uh, and four times more sensitivity is a lot. Um, not to mention the spectrum filter, which is uh, reducing your uh, transmission efficiency even further. In order to make the image look color balanced for daytime images. Yep. Yeah, and I should also point out that I this is after I had modified my camera to remove that particular filter. Ah, okay. So yes, so uh, your your DSLR is is uh, reflecting a bit of that H alpha away, um, and uh, but your dedicated astro cameras will not have that spectrum filter. Your OSC as astronomy cameras will not have Yeah, that. exactly. Like, you know, if you have a one-shot color, uh, dedicated, cool astronomy, it's not a DSLR, but it's a one-shot color, color camera, does it pay to use a hydrogen alpha filter with it? 
I would say uh, yes. Uh, I'm going to say there are going to be times when you're going to want to shoot a nebula, uh, depending on your, first of all, what are you interested in? Do you want to shoot nebula? If you want to shoot nebula with a one shot color camera, then an H alpha filter probably should be in your bag. Um, you can get a lot of red detail out of uh, a one shot color camera. And most of that nebula is going to be in the H alpha. It's still going to come through. You're still going to be getting it. But if you want to get a bit more contrast and a bit more structure on those same targets, the H alpha filter will probably eke out a little bit more. This only applies to the H alpha filter because I don't, in my opinion, I don't think that uh, the one shot color filters with their inherent disadvantage due to the pixels are sensitive enough to really pull out any oxygen or S2 detail um, because that's very weak signal to begin with. Um, that's, I'm gonna say that's kind of my opinion because once I go and say that's the long, uh, that's the hard rule, you can't do this, no way, no how, someone's gonna post in chat. Well, look what I did, but- um, well, there's, a, there's always exceptions, Adam. I mean, you, you, there's nothing for it. I mean, obviously if you, if you lay on the target for 200 hours, it'll work. Mm. Yeah. Another thing to mention my, too is, sorry, go ahead. Molly. Molly, uh, take it. Okay, thanks. Another thing to mention too is um, when you have that Bayer filter, even if you don't have the spectrum filter, um, you're because of the way they have to make the dye for the the each of the RGB pixels, the quantum efficiency of that, so basically the how much light gets through of that whole uh, color pixel is much less than for a monochrome camera because uh, transmission efficiency of those dyes is not as good as having um, like a full filter in front because they can make those a lot higher transmission. So, uh, I mean, yes, it, it can be done, but it might be worth saving up 1200 bucks and getting a, a like a monochrome camera and having both capabilities so that you can do one shot color sometimes, monochrome H alpha O3 narrowband stuff sometimes. That's my plan. I'm gonna I have a monochrome right now. I'm gonna save up for a one shot color for you know, something like comments. It'd be nice to have a, a cooled one shot color camera. Um, but I, in theory it could be done, but yeah, yeah, you are gonna have to spend a lot more time on that target and get a lot more data. Will it enable you to gather during the full moon? Um, yes, uh, it'll definitely allow you to um, get a bit more time on your target in various moon conditions. Um, I, I'm, it's, I guess I should just go ahead and say, the difference between shooting H alpha or any sort of narrow band, um, the difference between a one shot color and a monochrome camera is night and day. Um, so it's allowing you to eke out a little bit more time, but I wouldn't look to an H alpha filter and a one shot color camera and then look at monochrome narrowband results and say, well, this is what I'm aiming for. You, you, have, to, you have to kind of uh, limit your expectations a bit. Um, but like I said originally, uh, you have a one shot color camera, you might wanna have a monochrome filter, or excuse me, a narrow, an H alpha narrowband filter in your bag. Uh, do the RGB or narrowband filters for the uh, Hyperstar on the C11 Edge need to be somehow special? Um, RGB, no. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I don't have the Hyperstar. <clears throat> so someone correct me if I'm wrong here, if I make a, a, a slight technical error. Uh, RGB, no. Um, the wavelengths that fall within each individual RGB are very wide and you're not, in, nothing's gonna impact that. For narrow band, because you are shooting uh, so fast, it's actually going to shift, um, uh, it is gonna shift the, what is it doing? Is it shifting the spectrum or is it just shifting the filters? Uh, 
the what what's happened is that the oh go ahead Tolga. No, it's shifting the the uh, the bandwidth not off the filter, but off the light that's coming into right. your uh, into your sensor. But since let's say they're talking about hydrogen alpha is six hundred fifty six point six, and you have a three nanometer filter, and if shifts it by one nanometer, even by one nanometer, you're at six hundred fifty five point six. You just lost half of your data right. because it, it just shifted by one nanometer. But if you were at five nanometers, that shift, or seven nanometers, that shift doesn't really matter that much. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you have really tight uh, narrowband filters, that's the only time it really matters. Imagine the light is coming through a set of picket fences and uh, the the picket fence is only so wide that 656 nanometers can get through. And that's the only wavelength that'll be getting through the pickets on the picket fence. Well, imagine you move that light source off to the side a little bit, and you can see that, that it can't hit the pickets quite straight right on. And as a result, it's, that's what's called shifting the band pass a little bit. And so the, you're not getting as much light through there as you would before. Um, and and uh, it still it, works. It just doesn't work as good. Yeah. As yeah. It, it doesn't work as good as it was designed for. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, you've got uh, kind of a bell curve where the efficiency or the quantum efficiency of filters at that particular uh, wavelength that you want, that peak wavelength right in the center there, that's where the peak efficiency is. Uh, by shifting it slightly, you dropped over here. So instead of getting 98% efficiency, you're getting 60% efficiency or 70% efficiency or 20% efficiency, depending on the shift. And, and you know, somebody's given us good George, is it? Um, talk to Dean at Star Arizona if you want to know something about um, a hyperstar. You're talking to a bunch of guys that are doing the best they can and a bunch of people that are doing the best they can to get information to you. But we may not know all the little intricacies of each particular scope each and all the things that could be going on. Okay. And various people are suggesting that, hey, you could try this filter and that filter. I'd suggest you go ahead and try it, particularly if you're terribly wealthy. Okay, if you've got lots and lots and lots of money and you can just go out and buy a $650 filter from OPT and put it on and see if it works, fine. If you can borrow it from somebody else first, you may find out that they're all excited because they got it to work and they thought that was a great achievement. And uh, yeah, it's a lot more work. It's like, it's like Eric doing a 23 panel mosaic. Yeah, okay, I can check that off, but I'm never gonna do it again. And you might be able to get a hydrogen alpha picture out of your one-shot color camera. But do you really want to do that? And another thing is, like, you're really never going to know by looking at your data because you're at F2. Uh, you're going to get a ton of data anyways. So even with a three nanometer filter, you're still going to get a ton of HA. Uh, even if your transmission of your filter goes down to 50%, that's still, you're still getting a ton of light. You have nothing to compare it to. Yeah. How are you going to, like, uh, what's the test? If you look at your screen, you're going to see data. It's not like it's going to disappear because it's just the, the efficiency of the filter is going to drop by so much. Uh, so, the only way to do it is on paper and you know, you're going to have to see what the calculation, but uh, three nanometers, even the three nanometers are good until up till F3. They start dropping beyond F3 and hyperstar is at what, what is it? F2.1 or some, anybody know for sure? <laughs> I think it's F2.1 or F2. I'm not, sh I'm not 100% sure. F2. F2. Okay. Just, no. yeah. yeah, that's fast. That, you've got so much, so many pixels flooding the sensor that uh, the difference between uh, uh, 
uh, or, or I shouldn't say the difference between 50 and 70, but uh, you'll look at the screen and you look at the data and you're going to be happy with it. All right, so we've got, uh, wow, we filled up the, the whole show with uh, a decent amount of open topics. F2.2. Um, uh, I am trying to come up with uh, some specific presentations for the next few weeks. Might have a few open sessions. Uh, this upcoming month, um, if I keep doing open sessions, I might cancel one or two of them. Um, it kind of depends on whether I think we can fill a session. So just keep your eyes open. In that event, I will post them on the website, and you'll know. Um, I'll post them in advance as well. But uh, as always, thanks for watching. Thanks to everyone in the room for contributing. Thanks to all the people in chat for contributing. And uh, keep tuning in. We will be back next week. So good night, guys. Clear skies. <laughs>